What's going on, guys? Welcome back to the Chasing Clarity Health and Fitness Podcast. This is your host, Brandon DeCruz, and today is episode 102, where we're going to discuss how your food environment is limiting you from getting lean. So on today's episode, we're going to cover how your food environment influences your appetite, your calorie intake, and your body fat levels. And then I'm also going to go through some tips and strategies to improve your environment that will make fat loss dieting easier. So this is going to be part two in the series on how to reduce overeating. So if you haven't listened to last week's episode yet, definitely go back and do so as that episode was the introduction to this series on how to reduce your likelihood of overeating, where I covered the first component of uh, factors that predispose us towards overeating. So those were the nutritional factors and dietary decisions that drive you to overeat. And I went over what overeating is and how it contributes to stalls and physique progress and can cause weight gain over time. And then went over the various nutritional factors that increase your likelihood of overeating, including nutritional components like your food selection and your diet quality, the inclusion of hyperplatable processed foods in your diet, how food palatability or the tastiness of the foods we eat drive up our calorie intake and our propensity or our likelihood to overeat, the research on how many more calories of processed and hyperplatable foods we need to eat each day just to feel full in comparison to eating meals that are centered around whole, nutrient-dense, satiating food sources, and then how making poor choices around your food selection during a diet can ultimately stall your fat loss progress. And this is something many people encounter because they make decisions based off of what is available in the moment or what foods they prefer or they want a tasty meal. And oftentimes it dera derails their ability to make progress, especially from a calorie intake perspective, because it drives them to overconsume calories. And then it derails their progress as a result of undoing the deficit that they've created. Now, when it comes to improving your physique, whether that be through losing a substantial amount of body fat or gaining an appreciable or a substantial amount of muscle mass, we first need to focus on improving your approach to nutrition, training, and movement, as those are the big rocks that play the most crucial role in driving your body composition progress. However, your nutrition, training, and physical activity levels only are only part of the equation when it comes to the process of transforming your physique. Another massively influential component of whether you'll be able to achieve the best results possible and reach your body composition goals is your lifestyle, which is why I often tell my clients that we're not just aiming just for a physique transformation, but rather a lifestyle transformation. Because when you improve your habits, you modify your behaviors, and you dial in factors within your lifestyle, such as your food environment, your stress levels, and your sleep routine, you not only get better results from the work and you know the effort and work you're putting into your nutrition training, but you also make the process of sticking to your diet far easier, which is what we're going to focus on today. And over the last 11 years I've been coaching, I've been able to help well over a thousand clients improve their body composition and their health and fitness levels, and also to re reach their specific and personal physique goals. However, throughout that time, I've worked with a lot of clients who have certain bottlenecks within their lifestyle, which have made the process of habit change and behavior modification more difficult for them, especially when it comes to their ability to stick to a diet. And the most common factors within a client's lifestyle that I've seen act as an obstacle or a roadblock for many individuals has been their food environment, their stress levels, and their sleep quality, quantity and quality, all of which have led them to having trouble staying on track with their nutrition and had led to situations where they've slipped up off plan and overeaten, which at times have significantly slowed down or even stalled the rate of physique progress. And due to having ex uh, you know, encountered these experiences with clients so often over the last decade plus, that's why I always you know, say that quality coaching needs to go beyond the X's and O's of nutrition in terms of just macros and calories and training in terms of sets and reps in the gym. As in order to help someone become the very best version of themselves, we need to focus on improving upon their lifestyle as a whole. Because when I'm able to improve a client's overall lifestyle, everything else improves, including their consistency, their dietary adherence, their ability to manage their hunger, and ultimately, those improvements all add up and they stack up upon one another and allow this client to get better results as well as to look better, feel better, and function better throughout the entire process of, of us working together. So on this week's episode, I'm going to focus on the food environment 
and how it impacts your eating behaviors, your calorie intake, and your drive to overeat, as well as the most effective tips for improving your food environment so that you're able to stick to your diet easier and improve your body composition in a more effective manner. And then next week, I'll cover other lifestyle factors that also limit your ability to get lean and stay lean. So this will be part two of what will most likely be a three or four part series. So on today's podcast, we're going to specifically cover the food environment. And the food environment is defined as the physical, economic, political, and sociocultural context in which people engage with the food system to make their decisions about acquiring, preparing, and consuming foods. And when we break this down into like simpler terms, essentially what this means is that the food environment encompasses what foods are available for us to eat, how desirable these foods are, and how easy or hard it is for us to obtain certain food items. So your, your environment encompasses everything around you, including your home, your workplace, your office, where you, you go frequently, what you expose yourself to, and who and what you surround yourself with. And your environment not only includes physical structures like your home and office, but also visual and sensory cues. Like if you're constantly being exposed to the sight of pastries or delicious uh, foods, or you're being exposed to the aroma and the smell of baked goods. Now, the issue with our modern food environment today is we're in what's referred to as an obesogenic environment, which is an environment that promotes weight gain and one that is not conducive to weight loss within the home or workplace. And that's actually the technical definition, which was by Swinburne et al. And when we look at the primary factors within our food environment that influence your food choices and diet quality, these factors include the accessibility and ease of access that you have to foods, the proximity of these foods in terms of where they're placed or stored in your house and workplace, and the food marketing and promotional tactics that you're exposed to both in person and then also online. And the major issue with today's food environment, which makes it fat promoting for most of us, is that many of us are in an environment where they're constantly being exposed to foods. From an availability perspective, the vast majority of us have unlimited access to highly processed, hyper playable foods, which dysregulate our appetite and can drive up our calorie intake, which is something that we discussed on last week's episode. And it's also never been easier and more convenient to purchase and consume foods that aren't in alignment with our calorie budget and body composition goals. As calorie dense food sources are available at every department store, every corner store, gas station, anywhere you pretty much go to, and can easily be purchased through even uh, easier and more convenient means. Meaning nowadays we don't have to go to the store. So I'll tell you personally, I've never ordered through like Grubhub or through Uber Eats or anything of that sort, but we have so many options to get foods now. So we can order takeout. We can order food delivery through these food delivery service items like your Uber Eats or your Grubhub, or we can just go right through the drive through So all these factors lead to a situation where we have more calorie dense and tempting foods in our environment, which can lead us to overeating and gaining weight over time, which is honestly the situation that we see most individuals in. So we are in a time in history or, or a time in our society where we have something called creeping obesity, which essentially refers to the fact that over time we're precipitously gaining weight and it's kind of insidious. So if you look at like the CDC estimates, the average American gains 0.5 to one kilogram per year, which equates to 1.1 to 2.2 pounds per year. Now that might not seem like a lot in one year. However, we go a decade and the average person is gaining 11 to 22 pounds. So you compound that say from someone from their twenties to their fifties. And now that's 30 years that we have to do that math where that's approximately 33 to 66 pounds that they could have gained over their middle, their, their years within middle life. And so it's something we really have to be cognizant of, especially if you had the goal of improving your body composition and living a health, uh, living a life of better health and overall better quality of life. So next, I want to cover how your environment impacts your eating behaviors. Our food environment is one of the biggest factors that drives our eating behaviors. So if we put ourselves in a food environment filled with ultra processed, hyper playable foods, they're going to drive our intake of these foods up and negatively impact both our eating behaviors and our body composition outcomes. So a 2015 paper from The Lancet described the effects that our food environment has on our eating behaviors best when stating, today's food environment exploit people's biological, psychological, social, and economic vulnerabilities, making it easier for them to eat unhealthy foods. So essentially, 
Your environment can make or break your physique progress and your results, especially when it comes to how your, your environment shapes and influences your eating behaviors and habits, your food choices, your calorie intake, and your ability to stick to a health-promoting dietary pattern that is in alignment with your body composition and your health goals. And I often encounter people who think that adhering to a diet all comes down to one's level of willpower and essentially like their level of motivation. But these are both resources that we don't have an unlimited amount of, which is why it's important to focus on the variables that are within your control and what variables we can alter to improve your habits and modify your behaviors, where it makes it easier for you to stay on track with your nutrition rather than constantly trying to fight off the temptation of eating the chocolate or cookies that are on your kitchen counter or that are on you know, your work desk. And the more hyper palatable processed foods, treats, trigger foods, and snacks you have available at home and in close proximity to yourself, the more susceptible and likely you are to fall off track and eat more than you should. And research also finds that your home environment can play a massive role in influencing your preference for eating high calorie uh, density foods based on how frequent exposure you have to these foods. So for instance, in a 2014 study, they assessed the genetic and environmental contributions to food preferences within a large sample of twins to tease out what food preferences were developed genetically as compared to what food preferences were developed due to being exposed to foods in these individuals' food environment. And the results found that the environment these individuals were raised in had a greater influence on their preference for snacks, starches, and dairy, which led them to con conclude that the findings endorse the view of health professionals that the home environment is the main determinant of individuals liking for energy dense, meaning high calorie foods implicated or involved in excess weight gain, but suggests that we can correct this by encouraging exposure to more nutrient dense foods, especially within the home environment. The next topic I wanna to cover and dive into are the factors within your food environment that can influence your eating behaviors and your total calorie intake. And we're gonna go through a multitude of these, but the main factors we're going to cover include the distance slash proximity of the foods around you, the visual food cues within your environment, and the types of foods you're exposed to and have accessibility to. So factor one is the distance and the proximity of foods around you. So this first factor within your food environment that can influence your eating behaviors and your calorie intake is the distance, aka proximity, of the foods around you and where you have food available in the places you spend the most amount of time, which would include places such as your home, your office, and your workplace. And when it comes to food proximity and its impact on eating behavior, you are more predisposed and likely to eat foods that are right in front of you or within a close distance of you, as having food within reaching distance increases your food focus your drive to eat, and also makes it much more convenient for you to access and eat foods even when you aren't necessarily hungry or even in need of energy. And the influential effects that food proximity can have on our eating behaviors, our food choices and calorie intake is something that numerous research studies have investigated because this is one of the most influential factors. So for example, in a 2014 study, they tested how the proximity of foods within someone's food environment influenced their food choice and calorie intake, and whether or not they chose a low calorie food option of apple slices or a high calorie food option of popcorn. So to test this, they took participants and divided them up into different groups. And so they had three groups essentially. And one group had apple slices placed within an arm's reach and popcorn placed two meters away. So this was quite a further distance. In the next group, they had popcorn placed within an arm's reach and apple slices placed two meters away. And then the last group, they placed both apple slices and popcorn within an arm's reach. Now, the results of this study found that although each participant rated that they enjoyed popcorn more than they did apple, so this was something that they had asked them prior to actually putting them in the different conditions and into the different groups, the biggest factor of what these individuals chose to eat was the proximity or the distance of the food source within their environment. So when apple slices were closer to the participants, they ate more apple slices and less popcorn. But when popcorn was closer, they ate more popcorn than apple slices. And this effect was seen regardless of their personal preference for popcorn over apples. They also found that when participants had popcorn placed closer to them, they ate many more calories or much more calories in total, but their calorie intake was reduced most when the popcorn was placed further away from them. 
So these results show that whatever food source is nearest to us, the more likely you are to consume the foods, that food source. Meaning, if you have high calorie foods or snack items in your immediate food environment, such as on your kitchen counter or on your work desk, you'll be more likely to consume these high calorie foods and increase your calorie intake. However, one way to reduce your likelihood of overeating high calorie density foods is to remove them from your food environment and or to store them away where they're out of sight and essentially out of mind. Another way that we can use this data to help us in our daily food decisions is to keep lower calorie, high volume whole food sources, such as vegetables and fruits, within closer proximity to our eating environment, such as on our kitchen counter, like in a bowl, you, you have a fruit bowl on your kitchen counter, while keeping the highly processed, hyperplatable foods that trigger us either out of our food environment or hidden away in the back of a pantry and out of our line of sight. So we're less likely to desire these foods, have cravings for them, and also less likely to overconsume them. In a 2018 study, they looked at the impact of placing a bowl of unhealthy snacks different distances away from individuals, and they wanted to see what influence and what impact that would have on the total calorie intake of that specific snack. And to test this, they placed a bowl either 20 centimeters away from participants, which is about eight inches, or 70 meters or centimeters away, which is a few feet away. And the closer in the closer condition, significantly more the participants ate the unhealthy snack. So your likelihood of eating more was increased when you had it in closer proximity. And there was even people in the further condition when they were 70 centimeters or multiple feet away where they didn't consume any of this unhealthy snack. And they concluded that current studies provide the most robust evidence to date that placing foods further away reduces likelihood of consumption in general populations, which is a method that can be used to reduce calorie intake and the likelihood of overeating unhealthy food items. Now, this food proximity effect has also been seen in the beverage consumption habits of individuals. So for example, in one intervention, they rearranged the refrigerators at a public cafeteria to place healthier beverages like water, diet beverages, and sugar-free drinks at five to six feet. So they were placed essentially where they were at eye level for most shoppers. So think about the average person between five and six feet tall, it's gonna be right in their line of sight. And then what they did was they placed less he healthy beverages like your sugar sweetened uh, drinks and soda below eye level. So they weren't as visible to those that were eating in this environment. And they did this during the first phase of the trial. And then during the second phase, they made water available to purchase throughout the entire cafeteria in addition to the beverage section. So now it wasn't just in the coolers and in the refrigerators, they had baskets of, of water. They had water spread throughout the cafeteria where people could have access to purchasing that water and consuming that water or drinking that water essentially in multiple places within that cafeteria. And the results found that just shifting the placement and proximity of beverages drastically shifted the consumption behaviors of those that ate in that environment. So for instance, they found that bottled water purchases went up by 27 or 26%. They increased the purchase of non-calorie containing beverages like diet drinks and um, you know, non, uh, you know, artificially sweetened beverages by 13.6%. And then they decreased the purchase of high calorie beverages like soda and soft drinks by 28%. So we see a drastic skewing or drastic change in the consumption of the drink, uh, beverage drink behaviors of individuals just based on where these things are placed. So it can have a massive role in terms of what we're exposed to, what is within our environment, and essentially how close they are to us and how easily accessible or how difficult they are to get. So essentially what we're looking at is putting things that we want to consume or to drink in closer proximity to us. So for instance, I have many clients that struggle with their fluid intake. So often I'll tell them, listen, get, you know, either have a water bottle with you at all times in terms of on your desk, you know, on your kitchen counter, or, you know, carry one around with you or just keep it stocked throughout the house. And so with that, you're having exposure to things that are driving behaviors and habits that are more in alignment with your goal. But at the same time, if you're someone that struggles with sugar sweetened beverages or with juice or with high calorie snacks, keep those out of your environment and away from being in close proximity so they aren't tempting you. And you're less likely to not only desire those those types of foods and beverages, but also less likely to overconsume calories by drinking or eating. The second factor within your food environment that can influence your eating behaviors and calorie intake is the visual food cues within your environment. And what food sources you visually see and are exposed to within your environment can play a large role in what you eat and how much of it you consume. So in a 2020 study, 
Researchers looked at the impact of both food proximity and visual cue exposure on the intake of snack foods. And we have a lot of research which has teased out the proximity effect, meaning the closer food is to us, the more likely we are to eat of it. And how increasing the physical distance between ourselves and foods, especially snack foods, reduce our intake, both from a calorie perspective and then also of those specific foods. However, this study wanted to test how both distance and visual salience, meaning how visually noticeable foods are, would impact individuals' intake and consumption. And to do this, they conducted two studies where in one study, they had chocolate brownies, which were either left unwrapped and in plain sight or were wrapped. And in the next study, they had a large bowl of M&Ms, which were placed either close to participants or further away from them. And the results found that participants in the brownie study ate far more when they were exposed to unwrapped brownies. So it was visually appealing to them. And also when they had M&Ms placed closer to them, where they could visibly see them in their surroundings, they also ate far more than that and far more of the M&Ms essentially. So this led the authors to conclude that increasing physical effort and placing snacks further away appear to act independently and interactively to reduce snack consumption, as does the visibility of foods within our environment. Now, just like the proximity of hyperplatable foods can increase our likelihood of overeating these foods and overeating items that aren't in alignment with our health, fitness, or physique-related goals, we can actually use food proximity to get ourselves to eat more of the foods that are in alignment with our goals and could be foods that we're struggling to consume enough of. So one study tested the effects of food proximity on fruit and vegetable intake and, that th and found that when apple slices and carrots were placed in a bowl on a table near where participants ate, it increased their intake of these healthy foods as compared to when these same food items were placed in a bowl far away from their eating environment. So the lesson here is when you want to reduce your intake of specific foods, keep them out of sight, out of mind, and when you want to increase your intake of specific foods like fiber containing fruits and vegetables, place them closer to your eating environment because success leaves clues. So if you look at those who are in the minority of dieters who have lost weight and kept it off, they don't have cookies, cakes, and pies laying around their kitchen counter tempting them as that just makes the process of losing fat and keeping it off much more difficult than it already, need, already is or needs to be. The third factor within your food environment that can influence your eating behaviors and your total calorie intake are the types of foods you're exposed to and have access to. So the types of foods you expose yourself to and in the, and the order in which you select these foods can play a massive role on how much of them you eat. In 2015, a research group conducted a series of studies where they looked at the differences in vegetable intake when vegetables were presented first in a meal in isolation as compared to when the vegetables were presented alongside a more energy dense snack. And they found that when they presented individuals with vegetables by themselves, they ate more of them than when they were presented with both vegetables and M&Ms. And this is where a simple intervention, like swapping out your calorie dense hyperplatable snack foods for a lower calorie density, highly satiating item, like say vegetables or fruit can work really well as it'll increase your intake of healthier, more satiating foods and also reduce the likelihood that you eat foods that aren't in alignment with your goals. And even if you do decide to have some of the tastier foods, you'll be less likely to overconsume them due to having eaten a satiating whole food source first. So you'll be less hungry and less likely to overeat. Now in a 2019 Cochrane review, they also looked at how altering and reducing the, the availability of hyperplatable foods and or altering their proximity reduces the intake of these foods. So six of the studies that they analyzed were availability interventions, where they reduced the amount of food options available, or they altered the proportion of less healthy to healthy food items. And their meta-analysis of these studies found that when individuals are exposed to less foods that are considered unhealthy or not in alignment with their goals, it results in a large reduction in the targeted foods that were taken out of their environment. And the only reason I'm using the terminology unhealthy is that's literally what is in the paper itself. But essentially, these were just high calorie, hyperplatable, highly processed foods. And they found that exposing individuals to fewer food options led to a moderate reduction in these foods. Their analysis also found that when foods were placed further away from an individual, it not only resulted in them being less likely to choose that food over another, but it also reduced their calorie intake of that option. And this is where modifying the foods that you have available in your home and office and where they're placed and stored can help to reduce your intake of these foods and also can help you shift from overeating high calorie density foods that can easily derail your physique progress to shifting to eating more whole unprocessed foods, which will allow you to feel more satiated, experience less hunger and cravings, and manage your calorie intake much more effectively.
Next, I wanna go through some of the food environment optimization strategies to help you all modify and improve your food environment as your environment can either be your safe haven or roadblock to your success and the way you set it up can either help your progress or hinder your If you wanna eliminate the amount of obstacles you face during your physique transformation and health and fitness journey, especially from a dietary adherence standpoint, I highly encourage you to consider modifying your environment with the tips I'm going to lay out within this podcast as your environment can play a massive role, especially in your eating behaviors and calorie intake, as what you surround yourself with physically and visually can influence your thoughts, your wants, your desires, your cravings, and ultimately your actions. And really what you wanna do is you wanna construct a food environment which enables you to do the things needed to get to your goal easy to do, such as eating low energy density, highly satiating foods, while making the things you want to avoid difficult to do, such as overeating hyper palatable calorie packed foods. And I also can speak from experience that it's easier to avoid temptation than to try to resist it. So tip number one is remove trigger foods from your environment. The best way to limit your likelihood of eating foods that trigger you to overeat and engage in eating behaviors that aren't in alignment with your goals is to remove those foods from your home and office so you're not constantly exposed to them and have to fight off the temptation. And this is because when we look at the biggest determinants of eating behaviors, especially overeating behaviors, we see that factors such as the availability of trigger foods, the proximity of these foods in your environment, and the visibility of these foods within your environment have a massive influence on not only what we eat, but how much of it we eat. And seeing as we eat more of the foods that are readily accessible and available and visible to us, keeping foods, especially trigger foods, out of your home is a great and effective way to keep them out of mind and decrease food focus and your susceptibility or likelihood to eat these foods and especially to overeat them. Now, if you want to avoid certain foods, but you need to have them in your house for family members, such as your spouse or your children, simply keep them in separate cupboards, which you don't open frequently so that you're not tempted to grab these foods when you go to grab your own food. And you especially want to keep trigger foods away from your direct vicinity and essentially with, you know, not within an arm's reach. So they're not super convenient and accessible to you. So overall, keep trigger foods out of the house or at least in a spot where you don't frequent. So they're less accessible to you. Now, number two is to keep foods out of sight and out of mind and to reduce the food cues you're exposed to. So food cues include the physical proximity of foods in your environment. So how close are foods within the places you spend the most amount of time in? They include your visual exposure to foods that in can increase your hunger and appetite and the smell and aroma of foods. So first, you want to take the foods that tempt you most and either get them out of your house or say your office completely or to put them in a place where they're less likely to be visible, meaning take them off of your kitchen counter and put them in the back of your cabinets, your cupboards, or at the bottom of a freezer. Another strategy is to keep all calorie dense and like highly, you know, calorie packed items in one drawer. This way that they're, you know, essentially what this does is it allows this. So this strategy allows you to take them from being all over the place and essentially making sure that they're not spread out throughout your home where you're constantly coming into contact with them. Every time you open up your fridge or pantry to grab a drink or get your food items and sources out to make a meal. And this is effective as the further away you can stay from food cues outside of your meal times, the less likely you'll be to, you know, to be tempted by them. So don't keep food in close proximity to you, such as in your work desk or on your work desk or in your office space and keep them out of your line of sight. So they're not directly in front of you, essentially. And reducing food cues also involves what you view both on social media and on TV. And this is where modifying what you watch and what content you consume can be extremely helpful as even just seeing an image of a delicious food on social media or on TV can drive cravings and your desire to go out and get and also to eat hyperplatable foods, which are often the types of foods which have the most elaborate and appealing marketing campaigns and advertisements. And viewing this type of content throws off your ability to stay on track with your nutritional habits as you have to fight off these urges, which otherwise could have just been avoided had you been... Um, more specific and more intentional about what you were consuming. So please do yourself a favor and stop increasing your food focus by looking at food porn on social media and cooking shows on the cooking network, because that's doing no one any good. Tip number three is to implement effort barriers. Now, an effort barrier is simply a strategy that makes a process or a habit more difficult to engage in. So an example of an effort barrier is to keep snacks packed away in the top shelf of a pantry or 
tucked in the back of your freezer or placed outside of your home, such as in a freezer or in a fridge in your garage. So you don't have easy and immediate access to these items and it makes it so that they're not only more difficult to get, but it also takes some time and effort to dig through your pantry or freezer to access them, hence the term effort barrier. And this simple strategy gives you enough time or at least a bit more time to think about whether eating this food is in alignment with your goals if this food related decision is conducive or not conducive for what you're working towards and whether or not you're truly experiencing physiological hunger, meaning an actual need for energy, or if you're simply experiencing a craving or you're looking to food to provide you with either some distraction or some comfort from an unpleasant emotion that you're experiencing, such as frustration, boredom, um, sadness, something of that sort. Another example of an effort barrier, which can help us with overeating, is to eat foods that take time to consume, such as oranges that require peeling. So this will slow down the process. It will cause you to have to not only consume that food slower, which induces a greater feeling of satiety, but it also limits you from overeating because it, it, you're not gonna be able to rush through the process like you would with a fast food burger or some chips. And so the goal, you know, the goal with improving your food environment is to make the decisions that align with your goals easier to do and the decisions, especially food related decisions that aren't in alignment with your goal and aren't helping to drive you forward more difficult to do. And this is where effort barriers come in handy as they make it more difficult and more of a pain in the ass to eat the foods that aren't in line with your goals rather than allowing these foods to be easily accessible and to tempt you, which just makes sticking to your diet more of a challenge than it needs to be. So I'll also share like some of my own personal effort barriers that I've used successfully. So these are all strategies that I've utilized, that I've modified my food environment so that I'm not tempted because we're human beings. You know, we're all tempted by things within our environment and, and by foods. And so none of us are too good for these strategies or no one is so disciplined and has so much willpower that they can just have hyperplatable foods all around them and not feel at least tempted to give into them. So I'll tell you personally, there are two sweets I really enjoy, but I know that even with as much experience as I have following diets and tracking, that if I keep these two food items in my house, it'll present me with an unnecessary level of temptation that just isn't worth it to me. So these two items are both ice cream and then brownies, and especially brownies, to be honest with you guys. So what I do is the following. I don't stock ice cream or brownies in my home whatsoever. And if I want either, what I have is an agreement with myself where I need to go get ready and go out to the store to buy them. And the other agreement I have with myself is I'll either buy a single serving, such as an ice cream cone or a pint of Halo Top, or I'll buy a single brownie. However, I've actually, within the last uh, year or so, I found a healthier alternative to brownies now. So if I want them, I'll go out to the store and I'll buy a box of uh, the Halo Top brownie mix, which honestly is incredible. And now what I'm able to do is I'm able to get two to three servings for the same calories that I'd get with one store-bought brownie. So this is an effort barrier that was easy for me to implement into my environment and into my lifestyle, which has made adhering to my diet easier and slipping off my diet more difficult, which has been a win-win all around for me and the clients that I've had take this approach. Now, tip number four is to only have food out during mealtimes because when it comes down to it, especially if you're dieting, you're getting very lean, even healthy foods can be... Uh, overeaten. And so if you have foods, regardless of what it is, but you know, in, in totality, when you're in a dieting phase, when you have foods within your environment, they can serve as a temptation. So you should only expose yourself to food when you're preparing a meal or it's time to eat. There's no reason to just have food laying around, you know, within your close proximity at times that you're not eating. So if you eat a meal at nine, 12, three, and six, don't have meal, don't have foods all out within your environment, on your desk at work, on your kitchen counter, laying out, just like staring at you when you have hours to go until your next meal, because that's just making this entire process much more difficult than it needs to be. And dieting, especially for the goal of body composition change is already challenging enough where we don't need to stack the deck against us in terms of our ability to stick to a diet and also reach our body composition related goals. The last topic for today is why you should aim to improve your food environment. When it comes to improving your lifestyle in an effort to improve your body composition, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, which is why you should look to make the road to success the path of least resistance. So you're not constantly having to white knuckle your way through the process. And your environment plays a massive role in your habits and behaviors, and thus on your likelihood to succeed in your physique related goals. So your environment essentially refers to the surroundings or conditions in which you live and operate within, which can have a major impact on how easy or difficult your physique and health journey is. 
And if you're not willing to change your environment, what's within your environment and how you respond to your environment, your chances of succeeding with a body composition related goal are drastically influenced due to how large of an impact your environment can make on your food choices and on your total calorie intake. So if you have an overabundance of highly processed, hyperplatable foods within your immediate access and within close proximity, such as in your fridge, on your pantry, you know, uh, you know, on your office or work desk, you know, on your kitchen counter, the chances of making food decisions that aren't in alignment with your goals and the likelihood of you over consuming calories rises drastically. I've met a lot of clients over the years who think that they've fallen off their plans or have never successfully completed a diet or gotten as lean as they wanted was, you know, they thought that it was due to a lack of willpower or due to there being something wrong with them. When in actuality, it's more so due to having too much accessibility to foods that trigger them to fall off track and consume in excess and due to not putting themselves in a situation to succeed or a spot to succeed, essentially. And this is where we need to look at look to confront the root causes of these issues by modifying our environment to lower the likelihood of even being in these situations that tempt us. So for many of you out there, you'd benefit greatly from cleaning up your food environment first by simply not buying and stocking the foods that trigger you, such as cookies, ice cream, chips, cakes, you name it. Whatever hyperplatable foods tempt you, just keep them out of sight, out of mind, and out of the house, you know, preferably. Another method that's affected for those of you who live with other family members or roommates, because that's often the conversation I have with clients. They're like, listen, I have these for my kids. Hey, by all means, you know, if they enjoy foods that you don't and that aren't in alignment with your goals and the nutritional habits and eating behaviors that you need to get there, all you have to do is simply get a separate drawer in the pantry or even like a separate mini fridge to store your food in so that you aren't exposed to the items that trigger you every time you go to grab a meal or even to grab a drink. So for those of you who are pursuing goals related to improving your body composition and health and looking to improve how you look, you feel, and you function, I highly encourage you to take some of the tips I provided in this podcast and use them for yourself so that you can improve your food environment and make the process of sticking to a health-promoting diet and transforming your physique an easier, more efficient endeavor where you put yourself in the best position to succeed from a consistency and adherence perspective and the least likely position to be inclined to overeat and derail your progress. And for those of you who do implement some of the strategies that I outlined in this podcast, please do reach out to me and let me know how they're serving you, as I always enjoy receiving feedback from the Chasing Clarity community. As always, guys, thank you for listening to another episode of the Chasing Clarity podcast. If you need anything from me whatsoever, whether that be for one-on-one coaching or Zoom consultations or any questions you may have, please reach out to me through my email, which is b2cruisefitness at gmail.com, or you guys can find me on Instagram at brandedacruise underscore. And if you guys could, please make sure to follow us, whether that be on Spotify or iTunes, leave us a review and please do. And I love when you guys do this, where you share the episode on one of your stories and be sure to tag me at Brandon DeCruz underscore, because that is a way that we're able to reach more people and really help with the intention behind the show, which is to bridge the gap between research and information and practical application so that all of you out there that listen to the show can look better, feel better, function better and can also help others do the same. So I hope you guys have a great weekend. I'll see you next week. Peace.